This Elgin B.W. Raymond Railroad Grade Pocket Watch was sent to me by a viewer in California. On the surface, it looked to be in great shape, but appearances can be deceiving. This was one of the more challenging repairs I've taken on, but this watch is a sought after collector's item and was well worth the effort. And I got to use almost every major tool in my shop to finish the job. Every watch I work on gives me a great sense of satisfaction, but I'm especially proud of the outcome of this repair. According to Mike, it runs for a while, and then stops. It was serviced last year, but still not right. Well, it was serviced, so it can't be that terrible. Let's see what we're working with. We would expect to see nice flat lines plotted on the time grapher. Actually, I don't see any lines at all. The data is so scattered it can't get a reading on any of the basic timekeeping metrics. I can visually tell the amplitude is low, at most 180 degrees. Nothing stands out to me yet. At this point, I won't make any assumptions on the type of service that was performed. This watch will get the full treatment. Please hit the like button if you're enjoying this video, and don't be shy, leave me a comment below. I try my best to respond to everyone. This variant of the BW Raymond has what's known as a wind indicator. This is the subdial at the 12 o'clock position. A wind indicator informs the user how many hours has elapsed since the last time the watch was fully wound. In other words, the mainspring is fully wound when the indicator points to zero, or up. Beginning with the dial side, I first remove the motion works, which includes the cannon pinion, hour wheel, and minute wheel, and also the wind indicator wheel and its transfer gear. Hmm, issue number one. It looks like the balance wheel has a noticeable wobble to it. I can also hear what sounds like the hairspring rubbing on something. It can't be picked up by the microphone, but it's very faint. As it turns out, the overcoil of the hairspring doesn't cleanly bend up and away from the main coil and is instead sliding against the outermost curve. The hairspring overall is not perfectly concentric either. The balance is removed from the cock by loosening the stud screw. This is a truing tool, which I will use to correct the wobble I observed earlier. The balance pivots are seated in small holes drilled into the posts, and the arms of the tool are tightened down against the shoulders of the staff pivots. 
The indicator arm is placed close to the wheel so the observer can see how out of true the wheel is when spun along its axis. Notice how the gap between the arm and the wheel changes as the wheel is turned. And now, I incrementally true the wheel using this small pry bar. I'll simply continue bending it until the wheel is trued. On to the hairspring, notice how the overcoil is slightly bent inward. It doesn't look terrible, but this imperfection is exacerbated because the spring loses its concentricity when the balance is installed on the cock. Which leads us to the other issue. The collet is not centered over the jewel hole, and it's slightly bent out of the flat. The inner coil at the collet looks to be bent, which, along with the overcoil deformation, contributes to the failure of the hairspring to operate properly. Hairspring surgery is not for the faint of heart. It took a lot of practice, and a lot of ruined hairsprings, to become successful at basic manipulations such as this one. There are some true wizards out there that can take on the most mangled of springs. Checking my work, the collet is now flat and directly over the pivot hole, and the overcoil is no longer prematurely bending inward. The spacing of the coils is also even all around. Next, I'll remove the capped jewels prior to cleaning. This allows the solution to better reach all the jewel surfaces. The mainspring is slowly let down before proceeding with disassembling the train of wheels. Beware the reverse threading on the crown wheel screw. This gear on the underside of the barrel bridge is part of the train of wind indicator wheels. And now, I'll remove the train of wheels one at a time and carefully inspect each one for damage. The stack of gears to the right and those under the mainspring barrel form part of the wind indicator train. I'm annoyed I didn't realize this at first, but later learned that this wheel should have been held down by a screw, but if you notice the screw head is sheared off, leaving the threaded part stuck in the hole.
the wind indicator transfer stack comes apart for cleaning. Finally, I remove the yoke and remove the remaining capped jewels. The pallet fork bridge reveals another major issue. These jewels are absolutely destroyed. This is a first for me. I've never seen pallet jewels obliterated so badly. It's anyone's guess how long the watch has been allowed to run like this, so it's likely the pivot is damaged as well. The sharp edges of the crack jewel will score and deform the surface of the steel pivot over time. The lower pivot looks fine as expected, and as for the upper pivot, yikes. Actually, these are 0.13 millimeter pivots, and the mushrooming here has caused the pivot to grow to 0.136 millimeters. To address this, I'll use my jacket pivot tool made by Steiner. The jacket tool is a bow-driven manual lathe for filing and burnishing pivots. The main goal is to work a pivot that is worn or damaged to one that is nicely shaped and cylindrical from a pivot that causes friction with its bushing or jewel surface, to one that is polished and low friction. The jacket drums attached to the various tailstocks are numbered, representing the desired pivot size in hundredths of a millimeter. I'm now wrapping my bow around the headstock drum, which will cause it to spin back and forth using my left hand. The burnisher I have here is smeared with a light film of oil. In fact, the burnisher is really just a fine file, and it's harder than the steel of the pivot. The dead center protruding through the headstock drum secures the pivot not being worked, while the pivot to be worked rests in the numbered slot of the tailstock drum. The headstock pins turn the work as the headstock moves by way of the bow. The burnishing process work hardens the pivot by pushing material over it longitudinally along the uneven surface until it's smooth. When the burnisher bottoms out on the drum, the pivot has then reached the size indicated by the marking. When burnishing a damaged pivot, it's always important to consider the trade-off between size and smoothness. The overall diameter of the pivot was reduced to 0.127 millimeters, not too small to introduce any meaningful side shake, but its smooth and flat surface is restored.
All jeweled train wheel pivots are lubricated with Mobius 9010. For capped pivots, a small droplet is placed on the jewel surface before reinstalling them into their respective bridges. The new pallet jewels arrived and are reinstalled in the bridge. I also oiled these with Mobius 9010. High friction surfaces like the keyless works are oiled with Mobius D5. The winding stem and winding pinion surfaces benefit from Mollycoat DX grease. As mentioned before, I only noticed the sheared off screw later on. Of course, this was when the watch was fully assembled and the winding indicator wasn't working properly. Gee, I wonder why.
I finish up assembling the lever setting keyless works, placing a dab of DX grease on the tip of the lever that slides against the yoke. The balance wheel is reinstalled to the cock and I prepare the pallet fork by lightly lubricating the tips of the pallet stones with Mobius 941. When I took on this project, I didn't expect to be making any screws. Unfortunately, when I extracted the broken screw, I couldn't find any suitable replacements in my piles of donors, and it's next to impossible to find this specific screw for sale online. The screw thread needed to be 0.45 millimeters in diameter. I had to make the head wafer thin so the mainspring barrel had sufficient clearance over it. The upper and lower pivots are now lubricated with Mobius 9010. As the balance jumped to life, I can already tell the amplitude and performance is much better than before. I'll make some adjustments and then see what the time grapher thinks. The hour and wind indicator wheels are put in place followed by the installation of the dial.
As mentioned earlier, this subdial is an up-down wind indicator, which is not the same as a power reserve indicator you may see on more modern watches. The difference is that the power reserve indicators tell the user how much time is remaining until the watch stops running. When first introduced, wind indicators were especially handy for railway workers as they served as a reminder to keep the watch wound. I'd like to thank Mike for trusting me with his beautiful pocket watch. This was one of three watches he sent to me for repairs. Each had their own unique set of issues, and Mike was nothing but patient through the process as I updated him on my findings every step of the way. I hope he's satisfied with the results, and I hope you all learned something from this video today. And if not, I hope you at least found it enjoyable. Thanks for fixing watches with me today, and I'll see you in the next one.